Hello everyone. For a while now, I've been kicking around the idea of doing a 40k lore deep dive video on that recurring question of whether the Imperium is fascist. It's a frequent topic of conversations on 40k forums that almost never ends well, much like threads about female space marines. I've slowly, bit by bit, been doing research on the subject, because it is a more complex question than it might seem to be on the surface. Then Arch Warhammer put up a nearly hour-long video on the subject this last Christmas season. What do you know? I'm irrelevant. Or am I? Because when I actually buckled down and watched Arch's video, I had some pretty big problems with it. And not all of it is just opinion. There are things about this video that are objectively wrong. Arch's video is split into several different topics. The first topic is Arch arguing that the Imperium can't be fascist because it's not a dictatorship. Now, I have nothing against Arch personally, but this part is just bad. It's definitely the worst and weakest part of the video. So let's dive right in. To start with, the Imperium is not even a dictatorship. Beg your pardon. Most of the high-level decisions are made by a conclave of twelve High Lords. Made up of representatives of the various arms of Imperial governance, it is this body, via a process of discussions, deliberations, and voting, that determines the course of the Imperium. Okay, there are several major problems with this. The first one is that the Imperium actually currently does have just one person in charge. His name is Rabaudi... Rabout... Robot Guleman, Primarch of the Ultramarines. When Guleman returned, he made himself Imperial Regent, which puts him second in authority in the Imperium to the Emperor, who is considered God, basically. The Emperor, of course, has been hooked up to a life support system in a coma for about 5,000 years, so he's not going to dispute anything Guleman says. We also know from canon sources that famous tech priest Belisarius Call asked Guleman to make him Fabricator General. Fabricator General is the highest office in the Adeptus Mechanicus and one of the High Lords. Guleman refused to do this because he doesn't trust Call which implies that he could do it if he wanted to. If Guleman has the power to replace High Lords, he effectively controls all the High Lords of Terra. If any of them cross him, he can just replace them. By the way, Guleman is not the first person to single-handedly control the Imperium. Thousands of years before the current point in the timeline, there was a guy named Goge Van Dyer, who managed to dominate the High Lords by taking over two of the most prominent seats at the time, and became a dictator in an era called the Reign of Blood. And thousands of years before that, the leader of the Officio Assassinorium, named Drakan Vangerich, killed all the High Lords and replaced them with people loyal to him, ruling over the Imperium as a dictator for a hundred years. But even before that happened, when the Imperium was run by the Twelve High Lords, it was still a dictatorship, by most definitions of the word. Encyclopedia Britannica defines dictatorship as a form of government in which one person, or a small group, possesses absolute power without effective constitutional limitations. Wikipedia also has a definition that's very much in line with this. An authoritarian form of government characterized by a single leader or group of leaders, and little or no toleration for political pluralism or independent programs or media. But these are just definitions, you know, don't believe everything you read. Are there real life examples of dictatorships run by a small group of people instead of just one? Yes! The Paris Commune that ruled over the city of Paris for about two and a half months in 1871 came to power when a committee of far-left activists in league with left-wing members of France's National Guard overthrew the ruling government of the city and replaced it with a council of 60 people. They did technically have an election for this council, but everyone on the ballot was a leftist, and most of the people were far leftists. Really, there was only one position to choose. The elections were about as free as Saddam Hussein running for president of Iraq against nobody. Over half of registered voters refused to participate in the election. The Paris Commune was what inspired Karl Marx to come up with the term dictatorship of the proletariat, and it was his go-to example of what one looked like. 
On the right side of the political aisle, there was a form of government that was very prominent in South America for a lot of the 20th century called a military junta. A military junta is when a country is run by a committee of top-ranking military officers. Frequently, there was a dominant person over this council, like General Pinochet of helicopter meme fame, but other times, not so much. For example, the National Reorganization Process of Argentina. This government cycled through four presidents, one of whom was forcibly removed and replaced after he made some drastic economic reforms that tanked the country's economy. Although these presidents made policy, the source of their authority was always the committee. Another common name that's applied to the national reorganization process, especially in Argentina, is the last military dictatorship of Argentina. Another example would be the State Peace and Development Council, a military council of 11 men who ruled Burma from 1997 to 2011, also known as the last military dictatorship of Burma. I could dig even further and find even more examples, but you get the point. By both most common definitions and ample historical precedent, a dictatorship doesn't need to be led by only one person. The leaders simply have to be unelected, or placed in power through a rigged show election, have supreme, uncontested power over all other government bodies, media, and the public life of civilians, and all of that describes the High Lords of Terra pretty dang well when someone like Guleman isn't lording over them. The Imperium under the High Lords qualifies as a dictatorship. Beneath the High Lords, there is a further gathering called the Senatorum Imperialis. This consists of tens of thousands of representatives and dignitaries from across Imperial space. Its general purpose is much the same as that of the High Lords, to discuss and determine the best course of action for the Imperium. But this body is no longer in widespread usage. If it's no longer in widespread usage, how is it relevant to the conversation? Did you know that the Roman Empire still had a Senate for its entire existence? That didn't make it a republic in any true sense of the word. The Emperor still held all the power, and a senator or group of senators defying him would be completely impotent and could either be ignored or gotten rid of. The Senatorum Imperialis in 40k is very much the same. They have always been under the thumb of the true source of power for the government, whether it was the Emperor, the High Lords, or an Imperial Regent like Guleman. Speaking of which... The closest thing the Imperium has to the position of dictator would be that of Imperial Regent. Yes, Arch actually does acknowledge the existence of Imperial Regent, Although the way he presents it is... Just buckle up, we're about to hit the absolute low point of the video. A traditionally temporary position that draws its authority from the God Emperor. A position of absolute authority that's supposed to be temporary, you say? Like that position in the Roman Republic called... Dictator? You know, the one that's the origin of the words dictator and dictatorship. See, a dictator doesn't necessarily have to be a dictator for wife to qualify as a dictator. It's just that, as the ancient Romans found out, when you give someone absolute power over everything, it becomes very easy to use that power to stay in power. Funny that. And as such, naturally, has no true inherent authority of its own. Indeed, even the High Lord's power stems from the Emperor. They are the ones who interpret his will, the will of the deity. If that makes them fascist dictators, then the Catholic Pope <laughs> has some explaining to do. <sighs> so first of all, Vatican City is technically defined as an absolute elective monarchy. A new pope is chosen by the cardinals. He then selects a body of cardinals to serve as the pontifical commission who administer over the city. The funny thing is that if you compare how the government of Vatican City runs to how those military juntas I talked about earlier were run, they're quite similar. Vatican City just uses less guns. Indeed, it seems to me like the line between an absolute elective monarchy and certain kinds of dictatorships is really blurry. I'm sure there would be quite a few atheists and Protestants who would be quite happy to call the Vatican a dictatorship. But Arch's argument was even worse than that, because the only factor he used to compare the Imperium to the Vatican is that both heads of state claim to get their authority from God. And speaking of Big E himself, he 
is not a dictator either, simply because he is unable to be. He cannot communicate or guide the Imperium in any direct fashion, if at all. The only possible means of communication would be through visions or prophecies, and since they are generally received by a single individual, they are also unverifiable. It could be a vision, it could be a fevered dream, or simply a lie told by the few with which to rule the many. There is no way to know. And as such, the Emperor, in this case, is far closer to a traditional deity than he is a dictator. Well, if that's the standard, then we better retire the term Islamic dictatorship. How can they be dictators when, as Muslims, they're submitting to Allah? Absolute rulers of a more Christian persuasion can also get a pass. After all, they're mere servants of Christ. Basically, the only dictators who count are the purely secular atheistic ones, like traditional communists. Just remember everyone who becomes head of an oppressive, brutal, totalitarian government, always open by saying you're acting under the authority of God, Buddha, the flying spaghetti monster, or whatever. Congratulations, no matter what else you do, you're now not a dictator. That's not how it works. That's not how any of this works. By the way, even when the Emperor was around in person, he was quite the strange dictator, quotation marks, as he left most of the day-to-day -day running of the Imperium to the Administratum and the Senatorum Imperialis, which, as mentioned, was far more powerful under the Emperor than it is today. The Emperor even went so far as to hand over supreme command of the Great Crusade to his favoured son Horus, and the running of the Imperium to Malkador, and his creation of the Administratum, his army of bureaucrats. For a dictator, he sure was liberal with handing out the reins of power, wasn't he? I mean, how many dictators have you heard of that willingly relinquished power? <laughs> they are few and far between. What is the objective measurement of few and far between, Arch? That's kind of a weasel phrase. Off the top of my head, Cincinnatus, one of those original Roman dictators, was praised as the epitome of Roman statesmanship for taking the position of dictator, saving Rome from crisis, and then immediately handing power back to the Senate and going back to his retirement on his farm. Francisco Franco, dictator of Spain, who could be considered a fascist himself, or at least very fascist adjacent, relinquished more and more power the closer he got to the end of his life, paving the way for the transition to democracy after his death. Most notably, Mikhail Gorbachev dismantled the Soviet Union, ending nearly half a century of communist dictatorship and Cold War with the United States. These are just a few of the more notable ones. There's also Hastings Banda, President for Life of Malawi, Junta Leader and Prime Minister of South Vietnam, Wen Cao Kai, the previously mentioned last military junta of Burma, and many more. But, but that's all beside the point, since what Arch is talking about here isn't even relinquishing power. It's delegating authority, which is a very different thing. Every government delegates authority. That's not unusual at all. One person is not going to be making every decision about every military maneuver, every police action, every economic regulation, and every pothole in the street. Hitler had military officers like Rommel and other subordinates. Stalin had his administrators. It doesn't mean they relinquished power to those people. They still very much held absolute authority. And so did the Emperor. That's blatantly obvious from the Horus Heresy novels, where even the Primarchs fear the Emperor's retribution if they fail or displease him. Let, let me give an example of what true power sharing looks like, as opposed to delegating authority. President Donald Trump was recently impeached by the House of Representatives in the United States. He then was tried by the Senate, who found him not guilty of the charges that were brought against him. A single Republican senator, Mitt Romney, voted guilty on one of those charges against Trump. Now suppose that Donald Trump wanted to punish Romney for his disloyalty. Suppose he wanted to remove Mitt Romney from office. He can't. Suppose he wanted to have Romney executed. He can't. He can't remove all the Democrats who voted to impeach him either. He can't replace them with his own people, because Donald Trump's powers as president of a constitutional republic are limited. Contrast this with how the emperor ruled. 
The Horus Heresy novels are vague about a lot of details because they skip around in the timeline, and many events are not explained in detail. But probably the best explanation of how the Emperor dealt with those who displeased him is in the book The First Heretic. Quoth Lorgar in Chapter 10, I fear the Emperor will break the word bearers, and break me. We would be cast alongside the brothers we no longer speak of. They also reference the two mysterious lost Primarchs as the Forgotten and the Purged. Their fate is left mysterious, but it doesn't exactly take a genius to connect the dots. And of course, there's the major instigating incident in the book, the Emperor responding to Lorgar converting a planet the wrong way by glassing the capital city on the planet, followed by publicly humiliating Lorgar and forcing him and his legion to kneel before the Emperor. This is nothing unusual for the Emperor. Throughout the novels, the Emperor's behavior makes it very clear that he expects his decisions to be obeyed without question or dissent. No one ever gets anywhere by telling the Emperor no. The Emperor is not unusually generous with sharing power. He's not even unusual in setting himself up as a benevolent dictator who's going to eliminate superstition and usher in an age of progress and reason while simultaneously fostering a cult of personality for himself with the larger-than-life image he presents. These are traits he shares with Stalin and Mao. The only traits of the Emperor that make him an unusual dictator are the science fiction elements. Psychic powers, genetically engineered super soldiers, space travel, and galactic conquest. A big part of the problem with this portion of the video is that Arsh doesn't seem to have put much thought or research into what a dictator actually is. When he said the Imperium wasn't a dictatorship because it's led by more than one person, I gave him some benefit of the doubt because that's a common mistake to make. But based on some of the other statements he makes, it's clear he has this weird, narrow, and incredibly simplistic view of what counts as a dictatorship. So we're done with the worst part of the video. Next, Arch asks why so many people think the Imperium is fascist when he just disproved it, quote unquote. He suggests that one reason might be symbolism. He goes over the symbols that the Imperium shares in common with real-world fascist regimes, and then proceeds to explain that these symbols aren't actually exclusively fascist, and are far older and more widespread. This is correct. I don't have too much issue with this section. It's certainly a lot more accurate and better researched than the previous one. However, it doesn't really prove anything in either direction. The swastika is a common Hindu and Buddhist symbol. Determining whether someone using it today is supporting Nazism or Buddhism or Hinduism requires additional context. All symbols draw their meaning from context. Considering that the context of the Imperium of Man includes slogans like Beware the Alien, the Heretic, and the Mutant, and Burn the Heretic, Kill the Mutant, Purge the Unclean, I think that might be a bigger source of the fascism accusations than eagles and skulls. At least for people who have even a passing familiarity with the setting. After all, genocide and the purging of societal undesirables, particularly genetic undesirables, is strongly linked to fascism in pop culture, thanks to the Nazis. But then we get to the big one. Yes, we do. The big one he's referring to is the enormous level of ambiguity and confusion over the definition of fascism. Because I pretty much guarantee that for each person you ask that question, you will get a slightly different answer from each and every one of them. If anything, Arch is understating the issue. Definitions of fascism, particularly across national and political divides, often aren't slightly different, they're completely different. My favorite quote that sums up the problem with defining fascism is from George Orwell. The word fascist is almost entirely meaningless. Almost any English person would accept bully as a synonym for fascist. Orwell said that in 1944. If the term had been watered down that badly by then, Imagine how much worse it got after the Nazis actually lost the war and the full horrors of the Holocaust were exposed to the world. Then let that marinate for about 70 years and you get where we are today. 
With the utter destruction of the fascist power base, there was absolutely no political incentive to try and defend, excuse, or whitewash the ideology. Thus fascism became a universal ideological monster in a way that other ideologies that have inspired mass genocide, like Stalinism, Maoism, and the Young Turks, didn't. That fascists are oppressive, genocidal, and evil is something that has been firmly ingrained in the minds of every schoolchild nearly worldwide communist and capitalist, east and west. And with fascism as the ideological monster, fascist beliefs about, say, economics are now no longer a matter of honest study. They're a propaganda tool. Fascism is socialist, therefore socialism is evil and must be destroyed. Fascism is capitalist, therefore capitalism is evil and must be destroyed. This is how a lot of so-called scholars and experts on fascism operate and it works. Fear of fascism is a major tool of social control and political leverage and has been for well over half a century. Hence the massive proliferation of different conflicting definitions put out by ideologues based on cherry picking and pop culture, all to justify calling anything and anyone they don't like fascist. If it's violent, it's fascism. If it's racist, it's fascism. Any law you disagree with is fascist. It's no exaggeration to say that calling things fascist is the modern secular version of calling things satanic. So Pokemon is a game that teaches children how to enter into the world of witchcraft, how to cast spells, how to use psychic phenomena, how to put work supernatural powers against their enemies, how to fantasy role play. Pokemon world is a world of the demonic, of the satanic. I say this so that you can understand exactly why fascism is so poorly defined and yet is a label so liberally applied to everyone and everything. I also think that the way fascism has been used as a weapon of social control and censorship played a role in Arch's video and why it is the way it is. But I'll get to that in a bit. And to demonstrate this, let us have a look at a few of the 22 different variations available on Wikipedia alone. So Arch proceeds to go through a small portion of the definitions of fascism on this Wikipedia page, declaring some valid, some partially valid, and others not valid, before giving what he finally declares to be the true definition of fascism. He supports his assertion with quotes, mostly by Italian fascists, and a few by Hitler, along with a few very generalized statements about world history. In fairness, this is a lot more research than all the people who think they learned everything they need to know about fascism from watching Indiana Jones and Schindler's List do. In even more fairness, there are still major issues with his presentation of the facts. There's a lot to unpack, so let's try to break it down step by step. Let us begin by a definition given by a fascist, Sergio Panuncio. He believed that fascism was a nationalistic variant of syndicalism. Syndicalism was a rather extreme at the time form of revolutionary socialism. At a time where Marxism was still primarily focused on reforming the state from the inside out, the syndicalists wished to wipe away the idea of states entirely, in favor of a federal economic organization of the society and a post-capitalist world. Arch is equating syndicalism with anarcho-syndicalism here. A lot of people do this, but syndicalism without the anarcho at the front is a much broader category. It basically covers a wide array of beliefs that center on workers organizing into unions and obtaining economic power through strikes and violent uprisings. There are also pacifist strains of syndicalism, which obviously would be against the violent uprisings. The distinction is important because when fascists equate themselves with syndicalists, they're definitely not equating themselves with anarcho-syndicalists. They were, in all due essentiality, whilst oversimplifying a little bit, revolutionary communists. 
and then Arch equates anarcho-syndicalism with revolutionary communism. They're definitely related, but they do have important differences. Funnily enough, what Arch says is the difference between syndicalism and fascism is actually closer to a description of the difference between anarcho-syndicalism and communism. Sergio was essentially of the opinion that whilst syndicalism was on the correct path, it was limiting itself too much. It was focusing on local action and worker strikes in an attempt to essentially overthrow the state, whereas Sergio wanted to make syndicalism a part of the state. He would not merely seize the means of production, he would seize the means of state power, and through it, seize the means of production. Like I said, this is closer to a description of communism, particularly Marxism, where after the state establishes collective ownership it would theoretically dissolve itself, which oddly enough has never happened in an actual communist state, or Stalinism and Maoism, which cast aside all pretensions of ever dissolving the state. As for fascism, though, it never seized the means of production. What Italian fascism, which Sergio here worked in the government for, and which has significant differences from National Socialism, by the way, actually did was institute a much more limited version of syndicalism called corporatism, and specifically the type of corporatism it implemented was called tripartism. Do you feel like you need a spreadsheet for all of these terms yet? As far as definitions go, this one is too vague. It leans too heavily on syndicalism and does not take into account enough of the more fascistic leanings of the ideology. And so, it's not a great one. Oh good, I'm glad we wasted our time on it then. After this, Arch goes into a few other definitions of fascism from Umberto Eco and some Marxists. I'm not going to play or address this part because I basically agree with his criticisms. But then from the Marxist definitions, he gets back into the complicated relationship between fascism and socialism, with a couple of Hitler quotes. Outright declared himself a socialist in opposition to capitalism. Oh. Let us start with an excerpt from a speech made by Adolf Hitler in 1927. We are socialists. We are enemies of today's capitalistic economic system for the exploitation of the economically weak, with its unfair salaries, with its unseemly evaluation of a human being according to wealth and property instead of responsibility and performance. And we are all determined to destroy this system under all conditions. Yes, Hitler did say that. Before coming to power in 1933, the Nazis said many things that were extremely socialist. In fact, the Nazis' 25-point plan included calls to nationalize industry and divide profits. It's an unequivocal call for socialism. And if the Nazis had actually followed through on this plan when they got in control of the German government, I would say it's not debatable that the original Nazis were socialist. But what the Nazis actually did when they got complete power in Germany was very different. For more information on this, I recommend the video Why the Nazis Weren't Socialists, The Good Hitler Years, by the YouTube channel Time Ghost History. This is a channel run by professional historians, and their sources for the video come directly from German archives. The short version is that prior to becoming Chancellor, Hitler met with some of the biggest industrialists in Germany and, and promised them that he wouldn't nationalize the economy or pass any socialist measures. And Hitler largely kept to this promise. The Third Reich was full of privately owned companies that did a lot of work for the Nazis, not because the Nazis seized control of their factories, but because they were hired for government contracts and were paid. Hugo Boss is a famous example. Another example is Walther Arms, which was started in the 1880s, continued operating under the ownership and management of the Walther family through World War II, and has continued to manufacture firearms to this day. It certainly wasn't laissez-faire capitalism. It would be more accurate to call it an extreme form of crony capitalism. The government was heavily involved in the economy, but its involvement in the economy was primarily through hiring companies to manufacture things for the government, not seizing factories and managing them directly, and certainly not redistributing wealth. 
This wasn't because Hitler was a huge fan of capitalism, it was done for much more pragmatic reasons. These industrialists supporting or at least tolerating the Nazi party helped Hitler obtain the position of Chancellor in the first place, and then allowed the German military to rearm much faster than if the government had disrupted their operations by replacing their owners and managers with government officials. As for the other quote from Hitler Arch uses, Why need we trouble to socialize banks and factories? We socialize human beings. That is a very far cry from the Nazis' original 25-point plan, which quite explicitly said that the Nazis would socialize banks and factories. This is a great example of Hitler being a typical politician. What does that even mean anyway? We socialize human beings. It's a bunch of meaningless double talk to try and placate his constituents for basically violating a campaign promise. As a radical political movement, the Nazis were very much a house that socialism built. Socialism was extremely trendy in Germany in the 1910s and 20s. Anton Drexler, the forefather of Nazism prior to Hitler, established the ideology to be socialist. And in the early years of the party, large numbers of disaffected former communists and socialists joined up as a result, particularly becoming part of the paramilitary brown shirts who were responsible for most of the early violence against Jews. This is where the term beefsteak Nazi comes from, brown on the outside, red in the middle. But the Nazis as a government regime behaved quite differently from the Nazis as a political movement prior to rising to power. And anyone who ignores or downplays either phase of the party is not presenting a whole picture of what the Nazi party was or how it came to power. The Nazis can't be defined by a single set of economic beliefs because they changed drastically over time. The Nazi party first rose to prominence thanks to the violent political activism of socialists, but the Nazi war machine was fueled by capitalists. Habe dir Mr. Stichwort, eure Zeit ist knapp bemessen. So geht hinaus und habe Spaß, es gibt genug zu fressen. Sprach der Mann und stimmt zugleich ein lustig Liedlein an. Auch das sofort das ganze Dorf auch schön mit Grölen kann. 